Welcome everybody to Trojan Conquest Live 14. We have a really special show for you today. I'm very proud, proud and grateful to have Anthony Munoz uh, with us today to discuss his life, football, and uh, everything after football next. So again, all you Trojans out there, and maybe a lot of you Buckeyes, there's no reason for me to even have to try to introduce who I have over here uh, off to my legacy left on the screen, Anthony Munoz. Uh, awesome, amazing career, 1978 national champion in both baseball and football at USC, three-time Rose Bowl champion, uh, first round draft pick of the Bengals, number three overall, participated in Super Bowl 16 and 23, 11-time All-Pro, 1991 Man of the Year, um, named uh, to the 1980s Decade Team, the 75th Anniversary and All-Century NFL teams, I believe at number 12. You can correct me if I'm wrong overall. Um, and then Bengals Ring of Honor. He's also uh, in the NFL Hall of Fame. Um, and uh, he's one of two career Bengals. The other one who he worked campaigned very hard for to get posthumously in his teammate. I'm sure you could talk about that in a moment. Um, Anthony, so glad. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Tim, Rick, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Anthony, I appreciate you coming on today. We're going to talk about that 1980 Rose Bowl. And I just want to let you know right now that um, growing up as a kid uh, in Whittier and then Mission Viejo, we'd always, I was, we'd always wake up and watch the Rose Bowl because we, we always thought USC was in the Rose Bowl. But that, that one Rose Bowl with you and Charles White, 1979, I was 12 years old. And that Rose Bowl, I told my mom I wanted to go to USC. I want to be a Trojan. And she laid out a pathway for me. And five years later, I became a Trojan. So um, mm. amazing, amazing game. And we'll get into that. Looking forward to, to having you. We appreciate you. Oh, it's thank pretty you. I'm looking, forward, I'm looking forward to reminiscing, talking about the, the days at USC. Yep. It's pretty amazing as well. There's a theme here because my mom also was very instrumental in getting me into USC. Um, and as we'll talk about moms, let's go back to your life, early life in Ontario. You growing up with your two older brothers and your two younger sisters and your mom. Uh, walk us through the early Anthony years with uh, maybe some uh, with uh, Pop Warner issues and then also trying to ride around your bicycle in Ontario to get some games of baseball together. Well, you know, growing up in Ontario, like you said, about 40 miles east of Los Angeles, Two older brothers, two younger sisters. My mom raised their by, raised five kids by herself, working two, three jobs. Never knew my dad, never met my dad. Uh, he was in out of prison when I was growing up, and then uh, he passed away, so I never met him. But my my dream as a kid was to play in the major leagues. I was going to be an MLB baseball player. I mean, from the age of six, I started right with my two older brothers, and um, I realized uh, that you know I'd been given a gift uh, in in the area of baseball and. Uh, you know, the, the great thing about it with that gift and being able to compete with older kids, my older brother, Joe, who was eight years older than I am right away. And little did I know he was teaching me humility. He said, Anthony, you don't have to talk about how good you are. He says, if you're good enough, people will talk about you. And little did I know that he was teaching me humility. He said, just go and do the job. And uh, man, I, I did at the age of six, seven, I started playing baseball. Uh, again, like I said, uh, growing up there, we really got transportation a lot of times from my uncles and other people because we never had a car until about the age eight to seven seven eight maybe nine my mom bought us a bicycle and i tell you what that was like the cadillac uh you know i'd throw my glove on the handlebars and ride around in ontario and play as many games as i could in the summertime uh but yeah so that was it growing up uh played a lot of baseball with my cousins close friends and then just i would hit the parks in the off you know in the with Parks and Recreation Baseball, and then I was involved in Little League Baseball and then just moved up the ranks and until I got to high school, and that was still a focus of mine, you know, trying to be a Major League Baseball player. Yeah, you played, actually, you lettered in three sports. Is that correct? You're right, uh, football, basketball, and baseball. And, you know, I think the valuable, you know, getting back to my mom, the valuable lessons that she taught us. She didn't have to sit us down and teach us about work ethic. All we had to do is watch her. As she walked to work like 6.37 in the morning across the railroad tracks, she would walk three different jobs, packing eggs at an egg ranch or picking grapes in the field, or we would come home with 
pillowcases, uh, you know, of clothes that she would iron for our teachers and get paid for that. But then, uh, so work ethic and responsibility, she taught us as kids. Then I got to high school and I, yeah, I, I lettered in football, basketball, and baseball. I tell people, you know, if I could have jumped and shot, I might have been better in basketball, but, <laughs> but it was fun. It was great, a great conditioning sport for me, you know, going from football in between baseball and football. So, but uh, I had a blast. I wouldn't trade it for anything. I'm so thankful that I was a three sport athlete. And I think I go a little crazy when, when uh, parents and kids, they try to specialize and just have them play one sport because I look at my situation and I see how valuable being a third baseman at 275 pounds in high school benefited me. Being a 275 pound basketball player, having to guard guys and move my feet and then playing all the years, uh, all those years at offensive line, having to do exactly what I did at third base, sit, move laterally forwards and backwards and, and you know, move my feet like I had on the basketball court. So uh, I wouldn't trade those four years at Tafee High School for anything. I, I, I can't agree with you more. I think multi-sport athletes and just cross-training all those different muscle groups, but also just the muscle memory of moving. Yeah, you can see it through. And that's why you're next level athletic, you know, at 6'6", playing at USC and into the NFL. And speaking of third base, then, um, growing up, who who were your who were your idols? Also, who, who did you root for as a young Anthony Munoz? Who, was, who were you rooting for back then? Well, there's no question. I watched the Angels and the Dodgers, but uh, I think one of the things that made my parents or my family upset is uh, there was a one number 27 that pitched up in the Bay Area. I was a pitcher third baseman, Juan Marichal. You know, I, I emulated him. I was much bigger than all the kids I was playing against in Little League. So I had the high leg kick. And so Juan Marichal, whenever the Giants were on, I tried to watch him. I knew all the Giant players, you know, but still watch the Dodgers unless it was the Dodger Giant series. And I, I had to, I got to admit it, I had to root for the orange and black. And then, of course, being a third baseman, that was my primary position from the age of seven through high school, third base. And uh, there was a pretty good third baseman that played for the Baltimore Orioles. And that was number five, Brooks Robinson. I had a Brooks Robinson glove and I was, my dream was to have a, a glove with my name in the inside. Uh, so those two guys, uh, you know, were the two guys that I tried to emulate. And really as a kid, uh, I watched and followed quite a bit. Well, and then, um, you, you come from, uh, you know, your family and you have a family of athletes now. And this is going to be a great time to talk about it. So you can see those bloodlines in basketball came through, right? And definitely in football came through because uh, you and Didi are blessed to have two beautiful children, um, both starring in basketball and football. Uh, your daughter, Michelle, was uh, a, a basketball star with Pat Summit uh, for the Vols. Uh, Rocky Top, go Rocky Top. And same thing with your son. He was also a tackle following his dad's footsteps uh, for the volunteers. Uh, please, later, what was it like for both your kids to follow you athletically? You know what? It was exciting. Uh, the, the great thing about it at a very young age, uh, we had a chance to sit down and, and just kind of lay it out, you know. And I'm sure there was still pressure because anytime, you know, the dad of is a, is a big pressure, and you know, even for a young lady who's following, uh, you know, athletics after her dad. But we, my, my wife, Dee, and I sat down and said, you know, just because dad – played athletics, played on a high level, it doesn't mean that you have to play sports. But if you do, you're going to give it 100% like you do in the classroom with your relationships. And if you start a sport, you're going to finish it and give it everything. And I think that helps somewhat. Uh, we call Michelle the best athlete in the family. Uh, you know, she was our two-time Miss Basketball in Ohio, two-time D1 Player of the Year, committed to Tennessee in her sophomore year in high school. Uh, and Michael wasn't bad. He was a three-time All-American at Moeller High School. Played his first year of tackle football as a freshman at Moeller and then started on varsity three years and was all state uh, three years uh, at Moeller, two time captain and the number one lineman coming out of high school. And Michelle, of course, uh, she was a Nike All American and decided to go to Tennessee. Michael played all four years at Tennessee. Michelle played one and then transferred and played three at Ohio State, came close to home. But uh, it was so much fun watching them. I'm, I'm the type that's wired just put my hat on, my shades on, and just get my bag of peanuts and watch them. And, you know, I just uh, – I love the technical part of the game, and both of them were very technical, uh, and both of them had excellent uh, college careers. Uh, Michael had one injury, but he started four years. Michelle, a little different, had three knee, uh, three ankle operations, and her time was limited, but uh, played extremely well when she was healthy. And so that your children were both uh, heavily recruited just like you were. And so what was the recruiting process for you like uh, – Growing up, you're in Ontario. 
you're in Southern California. And I'm sure you're getting lots of interest. Um, what was the recruiting process like for you? You know, it wasn't, uh, you know, I look at Michael's recruiting process. He had five schools. He had the maximum. He looked, my recruiting process was Cardinal Gold is interested. Cardinal Gold is offering me. I don't care about any other school. <laughs> That's basically what I did. I mean, I was I was a USC fan like you guys. I mean, Rick, you mentioned, uh, you know, I watched, uh, you know, the Rose Bowl parade. I watched the Trojans play. I watched that big white horse circle the track. And, uh, man, I was dreaming for a day to, to be a Trojan. Uh, so I took, I actually took two trips. Uh, all the schools that called me across the country, I said, you know, I basically handled it myself. You know, my mom wasn't really, uh, you know, educated on the whole recruiting process. So as a 16, 17 year old, I was handling it. So I would tell the schools, you know, I'm basically staying in LA. Uh, so, uh, you know, I always felt if I took a trip to like LSU or Notre Dame and I knew I wasn't going there, that would allow, wouldn't allow somebody else to take a trip. So, uh, but I did, I did travel over to that uh, that you know Ritchie neighborhood in in Westwood uh, and took a trip over there because all my buddies were going over there and I uh, got to know all those so I went over there but uh, you know of course then what happened is uh, during the recruiting process McKay goes to Tampa and there's that little period where they didn't have a head coach and uh, UCLA put the full court press thinking maybe <laughs> they could uh, sway me to go to Westwood instead of South Central and once John Robinson was hired and. Bob Toledo was hired as a defensive back coach and was a guy that was assigned to me. It was like done deal. So, uh, you know, really the only, I can say I had one regret out of that. Just saying, okay, I'm going to USC and that's it. Is that uh, if you remember, uh, I don't know, Tim, if you're old enough, but Rick, you're old enough. Remember uh, McKay's last year, they lost to UCLA and uh, UCLA went to the Rose Bowl to play Ohio State, a rematch from a regular season game. And about two weeks before Ohio State came out to California, and I'll never forget, Coach Mummy off Woody's staff called me and said, uh, as you know, we're coming out to play in the Rose Bowl. Coach Hayes would love to have lunch with you. And I, I said, Coach Mummy, I said, I'm flattered that you would call, but I'm basically, I am committed to USC, and I'm there. As I look back, because I played with Archie Griffin and a couple guys, and they talked about Woody Hayes. I wish I would have just had lunch with Woody Hayes just to meet him. Uh, but uh, that's really the only regret I had in the recruiting process that I could have had a lunch with Woody Hayes and I decided not to. Uh, and I would have, I mean, I'd have felt kind of bad if I would have because I probably wouldn't have gotten there. In the but that's the recruiting process. But other than that, I mean, once USC started, it was like, I'm there. Well, and we're glad that you were because not only did you play football, at USC, but as I said earlier, you were also part of the 1978 national champion baseball team under legendary USC baseball coach Rod Dato. Uh, so when you came to SC, was it like a, a, a did you have a tryout or was it a package deal where you say, hey, no, I'm coming in football scholarship, but I'm going to play baseball? What happened with that? Well, you know, uh, the universities they all knew that baseball was my, you know, I love baseball. And uh, uh, they knew that I wanted to continue after college, but football was basically the ticket because that's how it's being recruited. And most of the schools, that was their pitch. Come to school, come play football, and we'll let you play baseball. But the one thing that USC had, they had a track record of letting guys play baseball if they were good enough. And uh, so once they said that, and uh, you know, I, recruiting trip, my weekend, they had the USC alumni baseball game against the Major League All-Stars. I sat on the bench with Seaver and Kingman and Dower and Buford and all those guys. And then the next day, and this is all a uh, football recruiting weekend. If you remember, the USC varsity used to play the Dodgers at Dodger Stadium in an exhibition game right before the Dodgers would go to Vero Beach. And I'm sitting on the bench in Dodger Stadium. Again, a football recruiting trip. So, uh, But like I said, USC had a track record of saying, okay, if you're good enough, you can play baseball, even though on a football scholarship. So that even added more to me committing and, and wanting to be a Trojan. Uh, but the only rule was, was your freshman year as a football player, you had to go through spring practice. And then you could play baseball after that. Well, I got hurt that first year. So, you know, I, I had to rehab and go through spring. So I didn't play baseball until my second year. Uh, it was my sophomore year of school. My freshman year of baseball. And so who broke it to you that you weren't going to be playing third base? And what was your role on the baseball team? Well, I think when you have like guys like Dave Engel, you had uh, a pretty good baseball team. I think every guy got drafted. Doug Stokes was the first time. Nate Hossler was the first time. 
Dave Engel, at, uh, you know, was there. And uh, Dave Van Gorder was a catcher who, you know, it's like, okay, where, where can I – I just want to be on the team and contribute. So, you know, before I, my arm got into shape, I played a couple of JV games, and then I played – they moved me up to the varsity. I got to play a couple games at first base, got to DH a little bit. But once – my arm got into shape. It was fungo hitting to the right field during infield and outfield warm up, and then I was uh, I was a relief pitcher, so I was fine with that. I think I pitched 11, 12 innings during that season, if I'm right about then, and uh, got to make the trip to Omaha and uh, got a ring. So uh, I still have some great relationships from that baseball team. Uh, last year I was out for the Cal homecoming game, the football game. The night after uh, Sunday night after the game, I went to the Trojan baseball alumni banquet. And then that Monday, over at Riviera Club, played in the Rod Dato Foundation Golf Tournament and got to see some of the guys I played with. So, you know, it, it was a great experience. I would have loved to play more baseball other than just that one year, but because of injuries, it was limited. But uh, it was a great experience. Well, then that then that brings us into uh, what most of us know you for, and that and that's your uh, football career, uh, both at USC and on with the Bengals going forward. Um, so you you signed on like you said to play for John Robinson. I'm just curious. I'm putting you on a spot here. We didn't discuss this, but uh, do you have any? Do you have a good John Robinson uh, story for us that comes, pops right to your mind? Well, I mean, you know, so I didn't know him, but I, from what I understand, he had a little bit of a, a stuttering problem before he got the head coaching job, and and really the only time when he stuttered a little bit, he had overcome it and was great. I mean, I love the guy is when he got mad. I mean, when he really got mad, he was, and, uh, but uh, I'll never forget, we're playing a game, and I forget, and he actually, instead of the offensive coordinator, Paul Hackett, running the video the day after a game, John took it, and he, you know, we played terrible, and he was running the, the video, and there was a few times where he couldn't get some words out, but we, we got the message uh, loud and clear, but I guess the best is, John loved, when we won, he loved to party, our Christmas parties, our training table, unbelievable during uh during rose bowl uh time i'll never forget we uh you know we had parties christmas parties at the hollywood palladium we had you know george carlin entertaining we had don rickles at, at training table but i'll never forget he was up, up in front of the whole team and he got pretty he was getting pretty excited wasn't mad but he was excited and he was talking about our christmas party and we're having you know george carlin and he <laughs> his notes and he goes we're having it and he gave us the date and he goes and it's at the Ha, 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 Hollywood Palladium, and that's H, he said. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, he laughed about it. But, uh, I mean, the guy was just amazing. I just, I mean, I love him now. I had a chance when they honored him last year at the homecoming game to de have dinner with him and his wife, Barbara, the, their, um, uh, Patty, before the, the game. And uh, it was just uh, amazing uh, to, you know, to play for John. And the guy was just a total package. I mean, and uh, – but he was he was fun. He was fun guy to play for. Brilliant football mind, but also a relational guy. I mean, like I said, the total package could recruit. Uh, with, and and the great thing about it when we were there was an open door policy. I hear about some of these college coaches where you have to either go through their assistant to make an appointment to see him, or you, John had the door open. If you were ever up there talking to coaches or doing stuff, he and you didn't stop by, and he got upset. He said, "Stop by whenever." It was an open door policy. Yeah. Well, so shortly in, so your freshman season, you got hurt. Your sophomore season was a great year for you. You got married. You you stayed relatively healthy. And then you had two more injuries. Um, during that time, I, I know that you're a person, a man of faith, and a lot of that, a lot of your strength for your mom, and also as well as uh, your faith that strengthened through your wife and your brother in law, um, really helped you get through a tough time at USC. Would you please just uh, go through a few minutes and just discuss, you know, the injuries, the yeah. timing of them, and what was happening in your life, both spiritually and as a person. Yeah, that's, that, that's great. Great stuff. Uh, my freshman year, as you all know, nine games into the season, I go down with my first knee operation. First time I'd really suffered a major injury. High school, three sports, four years. I can't remember missing a game because of an injury. But now, nine games, I get hurt, and the two games I'm missing are UCLA and Notre Dame. Uh, and then the road to freshman year. So I come back healthy. My sophomore year, I start. I play the entire season. As you mentioned, that year I get married. Uh, I play baseball that year. Uh, win a national championship on the baseball team. So, I mean, it's like, what more could you ask for? Things are going really well. Um, and also, that was the first time that really anybody had talked to me about 
faith. And uh, I really hadn't ha didn't have a spiritual component to my life. I didn't rebel against God, but I just didn't give God the time. And uh, that was really a time somebody cared enough about me as an individual, not about how am I doing in football, how am I doing, you know, out in the, my social uh, time, but how are you doing spiritually? And uh, that's when I really started to think about things. Actually, my freshman year was the first conversation. Come back after, several months after getting married, and that's when Didi and I started our our uh, spiritual journey. Uh, you know, that's when I realized I needed Jesus. And, uh, you know, and that's when I invited Jesus in my heart and uh, became a Christian as a sophomore at USC. A little bit I know that after making the two best decisions in my life, I thought getting married to Didi was the number one. But after going my making, you know, the, the Christian faith decision, that was one. And then Didi was two. And uh, so I'm thinking, man, I have it made. This is we're just going to fly through these next two years. And uh, NFL, here I come. Well, my junior year, we're ranked number one. We're moving along. You know, Charles White's having a Heisman Trophy year. We're on our way to wishing a, uh, winning a national championship. And I'm starting seven games into the season. I go down with my second knee operation. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. I'm not. So what do I miss? I miss the Notre Dame, UCLA, and the Rose Bowl again. So two out of three years, I missed the big games. Uh, my sophomore year, we played in the Houston Blue Bonnet Bowl. I mean, the thing doesn't even exist now. And uh, so now I'm going into my senior year. I at least got to start seven games on a national championship team, watch seven games for Charles White, who won the Heisman. It was still very frustrating. But I had Didi. I had my faith and uh, other people in my support group. So I go into my senior year, coming off the national championship. Brad Buddy and Chris Foote, myself, worked summer job together. We'd get back on campus dinner time we'd eat and then we'd go busted in the weight room and run going into my senior year probably the best shape i've been in all four years at usc strength wise conditioning wise and now we we open up in lubbock texas and it wasn't seven games in the season it wasn't nine games it was the second time we had the football i go down a defensive back six six helmet in my left knee i'm laying on the turf in lubbock texas i know exactly what has to happen i've gone through two of them we fly back Cedar side nine for the third time, going through my third knee operation. This time, my first one on my left leg. Not only am I going to miss the, the Notre Dame and UCLA game, but I'm missing the entire season. But I was bound and determined to only have missed those games. I knew we would win again the Pac-10, and I wanted to play in the Rose Bowl with guys I came to school with. Paul McDonald, Brad Buddy, Charles White, uh, Keith Van Horn, and guys like that, Jeff Fisher. And I yet to play in the Rose Bowl with these guys. So uh, I was, I guess you could say I was pretty much a madman. Uh, my schedule was, you know, go to class, go to Jack Ward in the training, conditioning, lifting, and then go back to the apartment, do some homework, shed a few tears on Didi's shoulder. I mean, because it was frustrating. But, man, every day, guys, I was busted because I knew we would win the Pac-10 and we're going to go to our third Rose Bowl, which we did, and I was determined to play in that game. A lot of people thought I was nuts. Uh, and Didi will jokingly, but she thought I was nuts too as a young married couple. Uh, but I was determined to play in the Rose Bowl. And sure enough, we win the Pac-10. And I got to tell you, younger guys, younger people look at me and say, Pac-10, what are you talking about? It's the Pac-12. I said, no, I'm an old guy. I played my first two years in the Pac-8, and then I played my last two years in the Pac-10. Now it's the Pac-12. Uh, but, yeah, so, you know, I was just fo laser-focused. Because come January 1st, 1980, I knew I was going to play in the game, and uh, and it worked out. I got that chance to play. I had to convince John Robinson, go in his office and convince him I was healthy. I understood his concern. Three knee operations, four years, missing the whole year, but I, I convinced him that I was healthy. And the doctor uh, confirmed that and uh, concurred with that and said, hey, there's no reason why. He, if he wants to move on, let him move on, let him play. And that's what happened. And I'll tell you what, I bet you the Buckeyes are really sad that you convinced John Robinson to allow you to play in that game because you look at, looking at this picture, you looked very healthy. And uh, if anyone goes back and watches this game, you see Anthony Munoz running down the field 20, 35 yards on, a play, on that last drive. Uh, we will get to the game in a second. But you see him moving that body down the field, looking for sec guys in the secondary and linebackers. And it looked like they were just scattering. Just like They wanted no part of what was going to happen there. Um, and Rick, I know you had some questions about the Rose Bowl. Yeah, I, <clears throat> that was an absolute phenomenal game. Uh, I want to ask you, Anthony, I believe that Alabama had played Arkansas earlier in the day, and um, Alabama was, was number one. 
USC, I believe, was number three going into the game. Yep. yep. Uh, and Ohio State was number one. Walk yep. us through. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you this was the game, like you had mentioned, this is the only game you played your yep. senior year. And you're playing against the Ohio State Buckeyes, number one in the country, in the Rose Bowl, yep. the granddaddy of them all. And walk us through your mindset that day. Yeah. Um, and then specifically that last drive. I've seen a video yeah. where Charles White had said on that last drive, the the defensive ends for Ohio State and the linebackers could not block, block Anthony Munoz, and everybody on SC's team knew it. And we can see you lined up to the left, to the right, along that famous last drive to, 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 to score the go-ahead touchdown. Walk us through your mindset, um, knowing that this is probably the biggest – it is the biggest game of your life at USC. So interesting yeah. to hear about that. No, it was. Uh, knowing that it would be uh, because – a lot of the experts, uh, you know, before the season had me as a high draft pick after I get hurt, lucky to be a free agent, lucky to, to get a chance in an NFL camp. So I was determined just to get into a camp. I didn't care how, even as a free agent, to see if I could compete in the NFL level. So that's why I busted my tail, and that's why I was able to play the entire game without a problem. I do, I do have to share this. So if you remember that year, Don Nospar played the entire year as a freshman for me. And then he got hurt right before the UCLA game, had a knee operation, which happened to me my freshman year. And then who steps in for him in the UCLA game? Another pretty good lineman, Bruce Matthews. So Bruce started <laughs> the UCLA game. So I convinced John to let me uh, you know, earn that starting job back because I was determined through the workout regimen that I went through. And I, I tell you what, um, Didi still kind of shares it with me. We had a one-bedroom apartment across the street. I would do all my lifting and bicycling and strength. And at nighttime, if I had a half an hour, 20 minutes or 40 minutes, I would turn the burners on in our little kitchen and I would jump rope in a sweatsuit just to get some more cardio. Uh, and, you know, so it was like a, for me, it was like a 24 hour a day, you know, workout and because I wanted to play in that game. But during that game, I remember I had to come, I ran out of the game for about two plays and Bruce came in because I thought I was going to hyperventilate. I was so geeked and I was so excited. I had to run off the field and just let my whole system relax, and then I went back in. But I'll never forget, I mean, you know, you got Keith Van Horn at the strong tackle, me at the weak tackle. You got Brad Buddy at the right guard. You got Roy Foster. All four of us are first-round picks. All of us, I think, played from 9 to 15 years in the NFL. Then you have Chris Foot at center who – was a later round pick, but played a few years in the NFL. Hobie Brenner at tight end. Marcus Allen at fullback. I tell people Marcus Allen was our fullback, and they're like, what? I said, yep, he was a fullback. And it was frustrating because we were running up and down the field, but we would fumble. We would throw an interception. So, And I tell people, and you mentioned it earlier, you said, how was my mindset playing against the number one team in the league? You have to understand, as a USA football player, I respected everyone. Every team we played, I respected them. But you have to understand the competition we had during the week at practice. I mean, as a freshman, Gary Jeter, Rod Martin, David Lewis, Dennis Thurman, Clay Matthews. Then as I went through, you know, with Charles Ussery and Dennis Edwards and Dennis Johnson, Larry McGrew and Ronnie Lawton. I mean, to get through practice, man, that was some competition. So come Saturday, come the Rose Bowl for the game. We were ready. I mean, I, like I said, I respect everybody, but it wasn't easier. But it was a, it was somewhat, uh, you know, comforting and not overconfident. But we were confident because of what we had to do during the week against our defense. So, I mean, I was excited the fact that we had a chance, and we understood Alabama was number two. We had a chance to beat the top, you know, top team in the country, and hopefully, if we did it convincingly, we could jump and, and win the national championship. But Man, that and, and John shares stories about that last drive. I think it was 80 plus yards where he on the headset he tells Paul Hackett, our offensive coordinator, do not pass the football. <laughs> We're running the football. And I think Charles had what close to 250, 260 yards. I don't know the exact number, but I know it was up there. And I remember just pounded, man. And and you mentioned right tackle, left tackle. You know, back then we were strong and weak. So depending on the formation. You know, I could be on the left side. I could be on the right side. 
it just depended. So we, you know, Paul Hackett and John Robinson and John Jackson, the running backs coach, felt comfortable enough switching us from side to side and letting them, letting us get some of each side of their defense. So I was thrilled. But I'll, uh, I'll, sh I'll sh I'm sorry. I'll, I'll share a funny story. You mentioned John Jackson, yeah. the running backs coach. We've had his son JJ on the show, friend of the show, and he shared a story. He was at that Rose Bowl sitting yeah. in the stands. I think he was 12 years old as well. And his dad had him sitting with Eric Dickerson. Oh, he wow. said, did you know that Eric Dickerson almost became a Trojan? Oh, yeah. He was hanging out with Eric Dickerson at that game. And I don't know if you remember this, but you went out there for the coin flip. Yep. And the grand marshal was Frank Sinatra. Yep, I remember. Old blue eyes. And let me yeah. tell you, Anthony, watching the highlights, and there's many years where I didn't have to watch highlights because I didn't want to – Remember some of the years of, of USC the last decade. Yeah. yeah. But you did it your way. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, it watching was that last drive for Charles White, and I always remember Charles White, obviously, but to see you clear space, I mean, holes <laughs> for Charles White, and to find out that that was the only game you played. Yeah. I mean, could you see the finish line in that last drive? Did you see what was awaiting? I tell you what, we, I really believed, and I thought we believed that we were going to score. I mean, we just knew that just keep it on the ground and, you know, pounding it. And with Marcus leading the way and Charles, I mean, you know, we talk about Charles White and the guy with 185 pounds, maybe 190. Yeah. One of the toughest, if not the toughest football players I've ever played with. And that's 13 years in the NFL. Um, the guy was just amazing. You know, I, I, I really believed that we were going to score. When we got the ball back and, you know, we had quite a bit of field to cover. I felt, hey, we can do this. And we were confident, not overconfident, but we felt good in what we were doing. Uh, and it was just uh, that day was, I mean, it was crazy uh, because it was, uh, you know, when you when you dream of doing something and you haven't been able to three of the or two of the three years you're in college and all of a sudden, you know, you think you might have a chance. Uh, you're working towards that chance. And then you got to convince your coach to give me the opportunity. Um, so it was one of those things that, you know, again, for the guys, but also thinking, well, just maybe if I play well enough, maybe, you know, even with three knee operations, an NFL team or two will be interested. And it just worked out to where Paul Brown, the great Paul Brown, who started the Bengal franchise, Mike Brown and Pete Brown, the two sons, they were all sitting together watching the game. And, and they'll share the story that they just sat there and laughed about how we just ran down the field over, you know, because Paul Brown coasted Ohio State. I mean, you know, Bill Willis, the Hall of Fame defensive lineman, played for him at Ohio State, played for him with the Cleveland Browns, you know, so he coasted Ohio State. He's a masculine Ohio guy right down the road from – or right up the road from Ohio State. So um, I think that helped me out a lot other than just being able to play with my guys and uh, play with, like, the guys I, I talked about, you know, Brad Buddy and Paul McDonald, you know – Keith Van Horn and Charles White, uh, you know, at least getting one of those games in under my belt. And, man, was it a, a gorgeous day. But you're right. You mentioned Frank Sinatra, and it's one of those things where, you know, because I'm, I'm out all year, and John lets me, you know, he lets me go out there and be a captain for the for the game. And so I was thrilled. And, uh, you know, I think I was like a little kid out there with my, my teammates, and then all of a sudden I look across and there's there's Frank Sinatra. So uh, <laughs> it's pretty cool. So, but, no, that was, uh, you know, the gorgeous day. I mean, uh, I'll never – got to share this story real quick. So the Rose Bowl, be the year before that, of course, Chris Foote was hurt also. So Chris and – at that time, Chris was married to Susie Foote, and Dee Dee and I were married. And so Hudson Houck is making bed check at the hotel. We were at the hotel with the team. So the four of us are sitting in I, – I don't remember if it was our bedroom, but we're just sitting there and it's bed check. So we're having a good time because we're not playing. So we're – where I think we're playing cards and just kind of laughing and stuff. And all of a sudden Hudson knocks on the door and he comes in, he goes, okay, you guys are fine. He says, but next year you will not be doing this. And we said, coach, that's right. Next year we will not. It'll just be Chris and I in the room. And of course it happened the, the following year. We both played in the game. Uh, so that was pretty cool. Well, we, we brought it up twice now. Um, the, the great Heisman trophy winner, Charles White. Uh, we lost him recently. Um, he battled and we lost him recently. Uh, Anthony, did you have just maybe a story, just, you know, just kind of wrap up Charles White or just speak to Charles White really quickly? Well, first of all, I think a lot of people still get uh, surprised when I say 
okay, I got a question for you. All-time leading rusher at USC. And they're like, OJ, Reggie Bush. I said, nope, Charles White. They're like, what? So the, my thing, my freshman year, we would usually, you know, I played half the game. We'd play half and half. But with the team we had after that crazy loss opening week to Missouri, games would be put away probably like mid-third quarter. So Rob Hurdle, who is our quarterback, the backup quarterback, he would run up and down the sideline as he was warming up, and he would say, Fight squad, let's get ready. We're going in to get some playing time. And, of course, I'd run in, and who was our tailback? Charles White. So, uh, so early memories of just, I mean, how hard he ran as a freshman, man. He got in there, and you understand that he was a fullback of a wishbone team at San Fernando. You know, they had guys that were four, three guys that were, you know, Kevin Williams, who was an Olympic sprinter, and, you know, another Williams who went up the, in the state of Washington play. And Charles White was the, the fullback. And all of a sudden, he's our tailback. So those were my first memories of Charles. I'd watch our, our quarter, maybe a little more in the quarter on you know, after when we'd view the film because we, we got to play and just seeing how hard he ran. And uh, But, uh, you know, and then to cap it off with that amazing game uh, against Ohio State in the Rose Bowl, the guy was just, like I said, I played with a lot of guys in, in all the years I played football. And probably, if not the toughest, one of the toughest guys I played against, and he wasn't that big. He'd run over you, he'd run around you, and if you blitzed as a linebacker or as a defensive back and you didn't see him, you were going to be picking yourself off the ground after the back of your helmet hit the ground, and the guy was just amazing. And, and that's why I picked this picture. You said how tough he was. It was one of the few pictures I could find that didn't have blood all over him because this guy was just a tough dude, and he he, he was a, a hell of a running back, and, and we, missed, yeah. we, we lost a great Trojan. Oh, uh, Yeah, we did. And then, so let's move. You also brought up um, Hudson Hauk, you guys. For those you, you do, he told that story. That's the legendary offensive line coach for USC uh, that coached the guys like Munoz, Mosbar, Buddy, uh, Foster, and Horn, etc. All the names that that Anthony went down and talked yeah. about. Um, the those those lines were incredible. And what we're trying to do at USC now is is trying to get back to that because we're talking we talk about the the Heisman winners, right? We talk about the Reggie Bush, the Charles White, the Marcus Allen's. And we, we, and we always bring up the fact that USC is running back you, but without the offensive lines these guys had, you would ne- we wouldn't know who, who they are. So right. um, could you just ex- express to us, you know, how important it is you have the, the right offensive line coach? I think we do have the right coach now with Henson. Um, he came in from, um, from Texas A&M and, you know, kind of continue the work that Clay McGuire actually did. You know, for the last two years, I would say that this one of the strongest units on the entire team has been the offensive line. Could you just share with us really quickly, you know, how important is that getting that right guy, getting the right offensive line coach? Unbelievably important. Let me just share something with you, and this is rare. We did have Skip Hudson with my, my freshman year at USC, and Hudson was the assistant, but Skip left with Makeda. So basically, Hudson was my coach there. So three years, four years at USC and 13 in the NFL, I had two line coaches. One for 13 with the Bengals and Hudson Howard. Um, so what you need is an offensive line coach and an offensive line. First of all, sound technique, technically sound teacher, and then attitude. This story. So four years, USC, 13, the NFL, Didi and I built a new home after I retired. So 17 years, 18 years after my freshman year at USC, I find my freshman playbook. How about that? And all the stuff I have in my basement and I pull it out and it's a, a, a binder, and I open it up. I want to just see what is said, what are the plays, how different. And, uh, guys, I open it up, and the first page, the cover page, there's one word in block letters, and it says dominate. I <laughs> flip the page, and it says we will dominate. As a Trojan, we will dominate our opponent the first play of the game, and they will surrender by the fourth quarter. That's what an offensive line's attitude has to be. And that's the attitude Hudson Hout gave me when we were at USC. And then Jim McNally with the Bengals. Our, our, our tagline with the Bengals was finish, snap to whistle, finish. And Hudson Hout, as I started, was a line coach that was on the cutting edge of technique. I mean, even though we didn't pass the ball 20, 30 times, we worked on pass technique every day one-on-one pass blocking with Coach Goo and the D lineman. I mean, we did – used our hands, and we did things that conditioned us to sit and move like no other. 
I mean, so I look at after four years of working with Hudson, and guys would give me a hard time. They say, if you're going to get hurt, don't get hurt during the regular season. Because I made every summer camp and every spring practice of four years at USC, but I only made one full season. But that training was invaluable. I mean, it was so valuable from Hudson. And he was, like I said, he was on the cutting edge. So it built a great foundation for me going into the NFL. And then I had another one of the best, Jim McNally, that ever coached in the NFL, who was a fundamentally sound offensive line coach. Year 11, week 13, we had a half an hour walkthrough before every practice all 13 years. Preseason, regular season, playoffs, Super Bowl, we always had to have working on technique. I was going to say, week 11, year 12, we were working on our stance. We'd work on our steps. Because you start getting sloppy with your stance, you start getting sloppy with your footwork. And so that's the only way I was taught, and I see that now with the Trojans. They have somebody that's teaching some amazing fundamentals, but there's an attitude. It's got, it has to be an attitude, especially when you run the football. You have to impose your will on the defensive lineman, and that's what we were taught with John Robinson, John Jackson, Hudson Hout, and uh, and that was a great foundation for guys you taught. And I mentioned, you mentioned, Van Horn, 13 years, one of the best. Brad Buddy, 10 years. You know, Keith Van, or um, Bruce Matthews, Hall of Famer, Don Mosbar. I mean, just go on and on. And Roy, just name the guy, Pat Howell. And uh, the guys played phenomenal in the NFL because of the foundation that was laid at USC. Yeah. And, and it's it's just been amazing. And you talk about my dad always told me when I was growing up in Little saying, USC, we have, we don't have just all American after all American. We have all pro after all pro coming to USC. And then, so we talked about your injuries. We talked about the the Rose Bowl. Heading into 1980, the 1980 NFL draft, uh, we just had the horrible news what happened to Andrew Voorhees working out, non-contract, hurts his knee, but tough as nails comes back and, and does the bench press. But you were in a similar situation. You had that great, you're coming off that great Rose Bowl. But, you know, with the injuries, there might be some questions about you getting drafted high. But you do end up going first overall. And the, the third, the th- sorry, you go first round, third overall. Uh, can you walk us through the process of, you know, how you were feeling, you know, you and Dee sitting in your apartment, thinking about what's going to happen next uh, and that whole draft process? You know, my attitude was if I don't get a chance to go in the NFL, either as a free agent, draft pick, it's not going to be because that I wasn't physically in shape. It might be because of the three knee operation I had, and they're looking at that, but it wasn't going to be because I wasn't strong enough, I wasn't ready physically. And uh, so I continued. You know, what you have nowadays, these guys go to Arizona, they go to Florida and train. What got us to that point? What got me to being able to play in that Rose Bowl was our strength and conditioning staff at USC. So we all stayed on campus and just busted it from that Rose Bowl to, to draft day and just continued to work hard. And uh, so back then, as they unlike what they do now, they have one combine now in Indianapolis. I think I went to four different cities. L.A., Dallas, New York, and Philadelphia. And I was always the last guy out of the medical examination. All the other guys would leave, and they'd be on the town, and I'd have to (laughs) see every doctor from every team two, three, four times, which was fine. Uh, And one of the, you know, people asked me, did this really happen? I said, yeah, I was in New York at Lenox Hill Hospital, and we were tested with the old Cybex. And I had to prove that my legs were strong enough because, I mean, I just killed them. And I actually snapped the arm on the Cybex when I was doing my test. <laughs> and I said, you know, like I said, I wasn't going to get a chance because I wasn't strong enough or I wasn't rehabbed enough. And uh, so I didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, you know, it was, it was um, the Lions, Jets, Bengals, and Packers, I believe, were the top four picks. And the Bengals had gotten a new head coach, Forrest Gregg, Hall of Fame tackle, all-pro garden tackle, played for Vince Lombardi at the Green Bay Packers. And they were the only team that actually put me through a workout. Forrest Gray came out to L.A., and uh, I wasn't one of those guys that said, nah, you know, I played a bowl game. And you just watch the tape, and you'll see what I can do. You know, I'm, I said, no. Nah. I said, what time are you coming out? How long you want to work me out? I'm going to do it. So we went to, you know, the practice field there on campus. Forrest Gray, still at that time, was probably 39, 40 years old, still young, 6'5", about 240, imposing figure. I knew who he was. Hall of Fame tackle, man. He's coming to work me out. So I was ready. Shorts, T-shirt, football shoes. And he put me through about a two-hour workout, man. He did everything. And 
the story that I share and Forrest shared it when we were in Super Bowl media day, and this is no exaggeration. Um, so the last drill he's working on, and like I said, Hudson Hawk was on the cutting edge. We used our hands and we would punch in college. I mean, that was kind of right at the beginning when you were allowed to extend your hands out and just punch a defensive lineman. So Forrest Gregg, his last drill says, okay, Anthony, I'm going to line up. I'm going to be the defensive lineman. I want you to just react. I said, okay. So I get out there. I'm at the left side. He fakes outside in, and then he tries to swap my outside. So whenever a defense, defensive lineman tried to swat you, what happens? His chest is exposed. So he did that, and I took both hands and just, boom, punched them both hands right in the chest. And the first thing that hit was the back of his head on the ground. <laughs> I was just like, my heart dropped to the ground. And I bent over, and I extended my hand to help him up. And I said, Coach, I am so sorry. And he looked up off the ground. He goes, that's all right, son. No problem. And I thought, I think that helped out. I think that was good. Well, sure enough, I mean, he was the only one to work me out. Again, even after that, I didn't hear anything and really didn't know what was going to happen. And then, you know, April 29th, 1980 rolls around. And early in the draft, Didi and I in our one little bedroom apartment, I think that little white complex is still right across the campus there. Uh, from the swim, you know, stadium and stuff. That's where we stayed for two and a half years. And our phone rings early in the draft, and it's the Bengals. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. And so, I, you know, Jim McNally gets on the phone. They just hired him as a line coach. And he says, Anthony, you're our man. You're our guy. We just drafted you. So I hang up with Jimmy. I'm weeping. I mean, big old 300-pound lineman is crying. Edie's looking at me, and she's like, okay, what's going on? I said, I composed myself. And I said, that was the Bengals. I said, we're going to Cincinnati. And we both kind of get excited, and all of a sudden, he goes, wait, wait, wait. She goes, where's Cincinnati? <laughs> I said, I don't know. We'll find out, but we're going to Cincinnati. And so the Bengals with the third pick, took me, and I'm sure there was a lot of Bengal fans wondering what the heck is this franchise doing, drafting a guy with the third pick in the draft that can't stay healthy. And uh, so that was uh, a little bit of my personal goals once I got drafted was to play 10-plus years. And every time the Bengals played on Sunday, Thursday, Monday night was to put the uniform on. And uh, I didn't miss a game until my 11th year because of a dislocated elbow. Linebacker hit me from behind. And so uh, missed three games my first uh, 11 years. Uh, so I played, I started 185 of 186 games as a Bengal player. Uh, so I wanted to make, uh, make sure that the Bengals uh, knew they made the right choice. So that was pretty exciting to, to when I got that phone call. Uh, draft day is a number three pick. Oh my God. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> <There's> some... <laughs> well, that, that guy I just said, number 79 was, I played, he played, he was a senior my freshman year at USC and I played several snaps next to him. That was William Gay, our tight end from SC. <laughs> he was, Converted to a defensive end. I played against him a couple of games for the Detroit Lions. He didn't like that very much. <laughs> no, no, I can see why. He knew. He knew. <laughs> when you went on to play in uh, Super Bowl 16 and 23, and my big question is this, do you and, and Ryan Lott have any beef that uh, from, from those 49er teams that beat your Bengals? You know what? We, we've never gotten it. I mean, I've known Ronnie. I don't know if you know. I competed against Ronnie in high school. We were in the same high school league for two years before I went to SC, and he followed following, you know, after I went there. Football, basketball, and baseball, I competed against Ronnie for two two years. Eisenhower High School, he played at in Rialto, me, Chafee High School. Uh, you know, we've never really hashed that out, uh, you know. Uh, you know, he's still like a brother to me. I, I don't hold it against him, but it is tough when I see him knowing that he's wearing not one but two Super Bowl rings that we were trying to, to get. But, uh, you know, Ryan, like I said, Ryan's like a brother. And uh, it's funny because uh, he um, there was one game we were playing in Cincinnati, and I think he intercepted or something. And I might have hit him a little late, but uh, I, I wanted to get a little piece of Ronnie because I never got to touch him uh, other than that. So <laughs> it was fun. It was fun. So I got to share this quick. Uh, so we're playing the 49ers at home. One of the first times that Sam Weiss uh, really allowed me to catch a pass. And I would line up a tackle, regular, but I would report eligible. The wide receiver would back off. I'd be uncovered. The wide receiver in the offset would get on the line so he would cover the tight end. 
So we would run running plays and, you know, and, but we had a play. I reported. And if we fanned out and if the outside backer came, I just took off because the guard had the PE and Boomer knew that and he would just dump the ball to me right away. So the wide receiver took off across the field, ran the corner off. I let the outside backer go and I get the ball and I see open field, but then I see number 42 in the middle. I go, Oh no. I said, hold on to the football because he is coming. <laughs> I gave 12 yards and he came like a heat seeking missile, man, and just took me and boom. And I put both hands on the ball and I was excited because I didn't fumble the ball, but he got me good on that one. But uh, I did, I did uh, increase my yards per cut, uh, catch. I had a 12 yard catch against him, but uh, he had an unassisted tackle against me. And I tell you what, I didn't go down gracefully either. <laughs> <laughs> you, you stole my thunder because. Um... <laughs> Nancy's talking about tackle eligible. We know he's a left tackle, but you know, on occasion, he decided to get out there and, and uh, get on get on the scoring himself. Uh, maybe you guys might not know, but Anthony had seven catches in his career, four of them for touchdown. So uh, pretty amazing. You got to jump the gun. I was going to get you on this one. I was going to say it didn't look like Chris Collinsworth to me at all. You know, out there in the end zone. Uh, but Anthony again showing off that, those those skills. Just one over here in a second. I'm not sure if it was Lynn Swan or Anthony Munoz was making this catch at the end here. Well, this is a catch. We had first and goal at the one with no timeouts. We had to catch this to, to go in overtime, man. I tell you, rookie quarterback, Ken Anderson's hurt, Boomer's in there, rookie head coach. When he called that play, I'm thinking, this rookie head coach does not want to coach in the NFL long. <laughs> Calling a pass play to a tackle. But we score, we kick the extra point, we go in overtime. Tim Breach, our all time leading scorer, kicks one of his nine field goals in overtime, and we beat him 20 to that's, that's, that's amazing. And just goes to show, you know, that you, you big guys can get out there and score some yeah. touchdowns. That's, that's where all that basketball and baseball training helped you out. That's right. So, um, last thing I wanted to talk about really was, uh, and I want to honor your time, we're running short on time, but, um, after you retired, after you uh, went to the uh, Hall of Fame, um, you know, your induction and and the and also you were inducted to the Bengals Ring of Honor. Um, you, you after you got done, you also started to continue. You you followed your your faith. You followed. You wanted to give back, and I saw a theme with you. You know, you grew up, and you need a leg up and some help when you were younger in Ontario to to move up and get on. And what you did is is beautiful. What you and your wife Didi have done with the Anthony Munoz Foundation is amazing. Could you just give us a few minutes to talk to us about your foundation and how people can get involved? Yeah. So this is our twenty second year. So what I did, I knew while I was playing that I would be relevant and you have some, you know, a little cool for something like that. But as a husband, as a father, and as an NFL football player, I didn't have time to, to get involved in a foundation. So I helped other organizations, uh, knowing that I wanted to start a foundation because when I do something, especially if I put my name on, I want to be totally engaged. I want to know what's going on. I want to be there to help the impact. And uh, so it wasn't until like eight, nine years after I retired, both our kids were like sophomores in college, and I knew they were going to be graduating, moving on. So I've been putting my plan together, and we started the Anthony Munoz Foundation, uh, engaging the tri-state area to impact kids mentally, physically, and spiritually. And like I said, we have eight programs. Well, like I said, 22 years we've been in existence. We have eight programs. We work everywhere from elementary kids to middle school, high school kids, uh, from you know education, leadership, uh, character. And it's a it's a passion of mine. Uh, you know, we've we've been able to to raise probably close to twenty million dollars in the in the twenty two years. Uh, every year at an audit, we're probably ninety to ninety five percent of the dollar going to the kids. Uh, we have two types of scholarships. We have a mentoring program. We have leadership camps. We have leadership uh, or uh, leadership seminars. And so it's it's one of those things where it is a passion of mine. And I'm there when I'm in town. I'm helping out. And this next weekend. We have our big dinner. We'll have probably 400 people. We have six. We have two types of scholarships. We have a smaller scholarship that we gave in April, two to five thousand one-time scholarship to 18 students. Uh, and our dinner coming up, uh, actually a week from tonight, we'll give out six twenty thousand dollars scholarships. And a lot of it depends on budget. The last year we gave out eight. The previous year we gave out like 17 twenty thousand dollars scholarships. Uh, and so, and then next Monday we'll have our. Uh, a week from tomorrow, we'll have our golf tournament. Uh, and then, you know, so 
it's something that I love doing. Uh, Didi, great support, my kids. Um, and But I have a great staff, great volunteers, great board. And like I said, it's something I wanted to do after I retired, but I waited until my kids were close to finishing school because I wanted to get involved and know exactly what's going on. I, I do all the most of all the development meetings with CEOs or their marketing people and you know, trying to raise the money for the foundation. And uh, we, we've got some great stories of young people that have uh, overcome some great adversity, uh, but been able to go on and excel in all areas of life. And uh, you know, we have story after story. So that is uh, something, like I said, we're 22 years into it. Uh, I'm not a young guy. I don't know how many more years I'll, I'll be going, but uh, it's been a lot of fun to, to be a small part of uh, thousands of individual lives in, in this uh, great area. So uh, I'm excited about next week seeing the, the kids that we're giving scholarships. I think at this time we have a, close to 30 that are in college right now. That, uh, wow. But we have so much, I think, I, I don't remember the exact $2 million of scholarships and the number, I think our graduation rate of this is I think in the mid nineties. We have very few that don't finish school that, uh, that we assist in, in, in getting to college, continuing their education. So uh, it's something that I, I get, uh, we tell them once, once you're involved in one of our programs or one of our scholarships, you become, I'm old enough now, I'm your grandpa. I'm your grandpa now. So uh, you enter the family and we do, we do whatever we can. We have to only get the scholarships and get them into our program. We need to, we should have try to mentor them and help them with different things. But well, I, I, I know that you're a grandpa, and you've got we're keeping you away from your family. You know, I, I joked with my dad earlier about the fact that you, you, you guys nine grandchildren. Is that right? Yeah, we do. So nine. that that tells us that you're more of a baseball fan. You didn't go to the full eleven. You kept your baseball team. So, um, listen, Anthony, uh, we really appreciate your time. Rick, did you have a question about the foundation? Yeah, Anthony, I think um, congratulations. This to me is uh, reading about your foundation. This is the greatest achievement that mm -hmm. you've helped out over 55,000 kids. You can basically fill the old riverfront stadium. Yeah. And I say this because my wife is on two boards. She's helped at risk youth in Long That's Beach awesome. with Operation Jumpstart. And she's also part of Girls Inc. in Orange County. And I see mm -hmm. the difference foundations make yeah. for these kids. Um, so my question to you, Anthony, is could you share a story of, you know, because these kids will come back and yeah. you've been doing it for 22 years. I know there's a lot of stories. Is there one you can share? Because that you're a man of passion and yeah. vision and you finish and um, share a story of, of how you helped out a certain individual and what they accomplished because of your foundation. So let's see. Uh, let me get try to get the years. So two, six, I'd say probably probably 12 years ago, we we do these overnight character camps. We bring in 120 to 140 young men for three nights, two nights, three days, teach them a little football. But we have chapel. We have character talks. We do a lot of team building exercises. We have one that's pretty multicultural in the spring. In the fall, we have 100% Hispanic kids. So we're doing this, like I said, 12, 13 years ago. And that's the, that's the young man right there. He's an eighth grader. He comes to the camp. And I want to do a marketing video because I want to go up to the league office and show it to Commissioner Goodell. We want to do these things with the NFL. So I asked Victor. I have the, the, the camp director, one of our chaperones, and I have Victor. Hey, Victor, can you say a few words about the camp? So he, we have him on video. He signs a waiver. So it's our marketing video. After we finish taping, he goes, hey, coach. Call, they call me coach. He says, I got a question for you. So Victor and I sit aside. He's an eighth grader, and I have to understand. He goes, what can I do to go to college? He said, I'll be the first to go to college. I know. And this is like four or five years down the road. I said, Victor, I said, there's a lot of ways to get to college with athletics and stuff. But I said, here's one thing that will guarantee you that you can get to college. When you get to high school, in your four years, you get the highest GPA, take all the clothes, just kill it in the classroom, and you can choose your college. So all of a sudden, he gets to high school. And, uh, oh, by the way, he had been bullied as a kid. He was a little heavy. He had leaned out. We have campers of the day. They're called MVPs, most valuable person, not most valuable per, uh, player. He was the MVP of our camp. He was the fastest camper. So now fast forward five years, and my staff gives me the stack of resumes that we're going to look at to interview for our big scholarship, the $20,000 scholarship. And on the top, the resume of Victor Ponce, that young man you just saw, is on the top. And they just smile, and I chuckle, and I start reading through his resume. 
He's got a 4.8 GPA, and he's, I mean, he's just done an amazing job. So he comes in. We put a half an hour aside for an interview for all these young men and women. He comes in with a tie, and he sits down, and we start interviewing Victor that we've known now for five years. And about five minutes into the interview, he says, Coach, Coach, he goes, I need to apologize. I'm like, what do you need to apologize for? He said, well, I just want to let you know, when I got to high school, I enjoyed football and I was playing my freshman year, but I wasn't doing very well, so I, I stopped playing football. So I want to apologize to you. I stopped playing football, and I want to focus on my score. I said, hey, you have nothing to apologize about. 4-8, man, you, you're on your way. And uh, so he received a scholarship. So he's like a junior in college, doing extremely well. He's interning with one of the telecommunication companies that has been one of our original partners. So we asked Victor to come speak to this Hispanic character camp, we call it. And he's a junior in college. We say, okay, you're going to speak at 9.30 Friday night. So you can get there for dinner if you want, 6.37. Victor shows up at 4 o'clock. The kids aren't even there yet. He shows up at 4 o'clock with the buddy. He welcomes the kids off the bus when they're getting to the camp. And he's like the Pied Piper, man. He, they just fall in love with him. He has dinner with the kids. So he's speaking to the 130 kids that night. And the first thing he says, he goes, I was one of you. I was sitting in those chairs like four or five years ago. And he says, now I'm in college. I'm a junior in college. He says, you can accomplish. And he gives him a great speech. Well, he goes from speaking at the camp that year to the following year, we invite him as a coach. So for like three years, he comes back. He graduates from college. He's working for this telecommunication company that he was interning with that has been a partner of our foundation since the beginning. And he's coming back and coaching these kids the same camp that he was at as an eighth grader. That's just one of the, the – and so two years ago – and it's funny. Two years ago at the Bengals game, the Bengals wanted to honor a kid that we've impacted and one of my board members who is a retired Navy SEAL. So at the game, we honored John Sanchez, who's a retired Navy SEAL, and then the Bengals weren't going to tell me. They were going to surprise me, but then they let me know beforehand. They said, we're going to offer – or we're going to give Victor two Super Bowl tickets for that year. So I got to present Victor two Super Bowl tickets. Little did we know, this was like in September, October. Little did we know that in February, following that season, the Bengals would be playing in the Super Bowl. So he got to go to So High Stadium, watch the Bengals in the Super Bowl. Uh, so that's one of the stories of many like that, that, uh, that we've been able to be a small part of uh, helping continue in education or having them at a character camp or mentoring them, you know, from like kindergarten through sixth grade and all of a sudden, you know, they're in college now. So it's, uh, you know, they thank us, but we say, we thank you because you're the ones that are doing all the hard work. We're just recognizing you. We're just honoring you. Yeah. That's, you've done so much, I mean, great things on the football field. Um, and it's your son, Michael, if you guys don't know, Michael gave uh, the speech for his induction ceremony into the Hall of Fame, and he he did refer to the fact that your, your your humility has always been the hallmark of your life, and the fact that you're here on our show, Mr. Munoz, shows us that that truly you are a humble man. But also the fact that a lot of people talk about their faith, but very few people actually live their faith. And he referred to you as the man who walks with God. And um, thank you so much for being on our show. Uh, we know on the travel day you came in here exhausted, probably. <laughs> Um, from traveling, he, he flew in today from, from California. Uh, we had some technical difficulties for the show, and Michelle helped you out with it. And uh, I just want to thank you, um, from Bomb My Heart, for coming and checking out our show. You guys out there, um, you know, we are striving to get the best guests we can possibly get for the show, and we will continue to do so. I can't promise you that we're gonna get Hall of Fame members every week, but we are gonna do our best. Um, Mr. Munoz, thank you so much. For, for taking time out of your day and coming away from your wonderful grandchildren and your, and your children. Um, and all you guys out there, please, though, if you're out there right now and you're still with us, please go ahead and hit that like button and subscribe if you feel like the show was worth your time. It really helps to grow the show and let us know. I know this content is definitely worthwhile, but in future other episodes, it lets us know that you're enjoying what we're bringing for you. Rick, any final words? I just want to say thank you, Anthony. It's a pleasure meeting you. And those 55,000 uh, individuals, those, those kids – um, that's your greatest legacy because they are going to go out into all parts of the world and carry your legacy of humility, passion, striving for excellence. So that's an awesome story. 
It was a pleasure meeting you. Thank you for your time. Rick, thank you. Appreciate it. Nice meeting you. And Tim, good seeing you. Please pass on our best, Didi and myself, to your parents. I will, definitely. So That's everybody it. out there, Anthony, before they go, we need one big fight on from you. Fight on.